Good morning again. <clears throat> you know, there is a mighty revival coming. I want to read about it in Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4. Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. We might call this the fourth angel. You all know about the three angels, right? Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils. And the hold of every foul spirit, and cage for every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And verse 5, For her sins have reached to heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. This mighty angel has a message so powerful that the earth is lighted with the glory of God. Glory of God being the character of God, right? The last message of mercy to this world is a revelation of God's character. He's a good God with a capital G. And uh, a mighty message about God's character that will turn multitudes of people back to God and the greatest revival that has taken place in this world since time began. We might call this message the fourth angel. We're familiar with the three angels of Revelation 14. They proclaim an everlasting gospel. They give God all the glory. That's a righteousness by faith idea. They give all the glory to him for their salvation and for everything that they have and know. They proclaim the judgment hours come. They proclaim the Sabbath. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. They proclaim that Babylon has fallen. And they give a stern warning against receiving the mark of the beast when it's urged upon all of the inhabitants of our planet. That's all ahead of us. This fourth angel joins the three angels at just the appropriate time. A powerful chorus of praise to God that swells into a loud cry just before human probation closes. This is an extension of the first century revival called Pentecost. We're all familiar with that, the days of the, of the apostles. Pentecost, as the character of God is put on full display in the lives and witnesses of his end time workers. And the world will be called upon to honor God. So powerful will be the proclamation that a multitude which no man can number will take their stand with Jesus. This revival will join three angels with a powerful judgment hour and Sabbath message. Sabbath? Why Sabbath? What does Sabbath have to do with this message? Let's turn in our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 12 and 20. Ezekiel 20, verses 12 and 20. Here's what it says. Moreover also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. That's the real genius behind Sabbath. So we know who God is, right? Who is our God? In the scripture reading, we we found out that he's the creator, he's the savior, he's the redeemer. And verse 20, And hallow my Sabbath that they shall be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. That's what Sabbath means. And who is that God whom we should remember and cherish and know? Titus chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. That's just a little book. Right before Hebrews, Titus, chapter 3, 2, verses 13 and 14. I'm sorry. Titus 2, verses 13 and 14. Looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's what we're looking forward to. That's the blessed hope. That's why we're here this morning. Jesus is the great God and Savior who will soon come in the clouds of heaven. Reference is made to this in the gospel prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 43, verse 1. A creator is mentioned there who has redeemed us. He's the Lord. And the Sabbath is a sign that we are his. When we keep Sabbath holy, we acknowledge who it is that has a first claim on us, to whom we really belong. After all, he is our Savior and Creator. And we just read from Isaiah. I want to read from Isaiah 43 uh, a few more verses. If you'll turn with me to Isaiah 43. This is a powerful chapter. Isaiah is the gospel prophet. Isaiah chapter 43, verse, uh, I want to read verse 3, 10 and 11, and kind of onward. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 3. I've got a new Bible here. It doesn't work. Pages don't come apart too good yet. Isaiah 43, verse 3. It says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I gave Egypt for your ransom and Ethiopia and Seba for you. And verse 10. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed, and there is no strange God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. And verse 15, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of, the creator of Israel, your King. And verse 16, Thus saith the Lord, which makes a way in the sea, and a path in the mighty waters. And verse 25, I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. That Jesus is the Lord God of the Old Testament. That's without question. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it talks about him who led them across the Red Sea and talked about the water from the rock, and it says that rock is who? Christ. That rock is him. Acts 1, 9 to 11. I'd like to have us look at this one. Acts chapter 1, 9 to 11. This we can relate to. Acts chapter 1, 9 to 11. We're all familiar with this uh, event. And when he had spoken these things, while he beheld, he was taken up, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven he, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. This same Jesus, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, Matthew 12, verse 8, and Mark 2, 27 will come in like manner as you've seen him go, as he ascends out of their sight and recede by a cloud. And <clears throat> when he comes again, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it will be the Lord himself. Aren't you glad? The one we're familiar with. It'll be the Lord himself. And as we read in Titus 2, 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This mighty angel of Revelation 18 prepares the world for this. We're looking forward to that. The greatest revival this earth has ever seen. Someone said, I'm sorry, the same one who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Redeemer here. The gospel message of, rede of redemption gives way to a promise that Jesus made to us 
He made it to the disciples, but he made it to us. Some 2,000 years ago, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is the message that has kept the church alive for 2,000 years. And we've come to that time now when we believe that Jesus is going to come. The message of three angels prepares a people for the appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In the now, it's difficult to find interested people. You can wear out a pair of shoes just to find a few people who would like to learn about this. But I have to tell you, help is on the way. Help is on the way. That fourth angel joins and lights up the earth with the message of Christ's righteousness, his righteousness, his righteous character of love for all of earth's people. The world yet waits to hear such a convincing message. No one who truly wills will be left out when this angel uh, covers the earth with God's glory. So great will be the revival by this first angel. In the first century came Pentecost, a mighty outpouring of the spirit, of spirit power, so that by 64 AD, the apostle Paul could, de could declare the gospel has gone to every creature under heaven. That's how mighty Pentecost was, carried to everybody. Can you believe it? And Pentecost is still with us. The former reign is still here, available for our, for our needs in this, in this 2021. But greater power is coming. The latter reign of the Holy Spirit. You know, Joel chapter 2 is an end time chapter. I just love to read it. It instructs us about the coming of the end time spirit revival called the latter rain. I'd like to have you turn with me to Joel chapter 2, verse 23. Joel chapter 2, verse 23. It's a short ways after Daniel. It's Daniel, Hosea, Joel. If you've been studying Daniel, it'll fall right, right, right open to Daniel, and then you go over two more books. Joel chapter 2, verse 23. End time chapter. It says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and we have the former rain since Pentecost. And he will cause to come down upon you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the same month. These things are going to happen contemporaneously, <laughs> and it'll, it'll, be a, it'll be a mighty, mighty revival, a revival which we should pray for even now, because in Zechariah 10, verse 1, it says, pray for the rain in the time of the latter rain. <laughs> We're living in the time of the latter rain. We should be praying for it. I'll have to tell you, it hasn't fallen yet. You'll know when it's falling. The great blending of spirit power will come in the form of revival that will usher in the coming of the second Jesus, second coming of Jesus. What a day that will be as it changes, as it climaxes the greatest revival and gospel outreach in the history of the world it is to that day that we are now approaching. This fourth angel comes with latter rain power and the appeal will be, come out of her, my people. For Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people. We have a wonderful message to carry to the world. And out of the world will come people by the thousands, even I believe from the millions, it will result in a multitude of people which no man can number. You can read about that in Revelation 7, verse 9. Joel 2 is an, is an atonement, day of atonement chapter. Have we heard about that lately? Joel 2 is a day of atonement chapter with trumpets blowing. Peter refers to Joel 2 in his Pentecostal sermon in Acts 2. Here Peter refers to signs in the sun, moon, and stars. And these signs will appear again in the end of the world and herald the coming of Jesus in power and glory. While we're in Joel 2, let's look at 28 and 29. 28 to 32. Notice, this is an end time chapter. It's all about the Day of Atonement. On the ancient, in the ancient times, when they had the Day of Atonement, this Chapter was read. Wonderful chapter. We're living in the Day of Atonement, the great antitypical Day of Atonement. 
Jesus wants to come. There's nobody in this whole universe wants to see the work fat finished more than Jesus does. 28, verse 28, Joel 2, 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And, up, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And I just love verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Delivered. Anybody here want deliverance? (laughs) Amen. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Wow. Wow. We could read about the coming of Jesus in power and glory. Matthew 16, 27 and Matthew 25, 31. The message of four angels, four angels, mind you. The fourth angel joins the three in proclaiming a message that Jesus is coming. I would like to suggest that when, when the fourth angel sounds, the latter rain will be falling And the final atonement will be going on in heaven and sins will be blotted out. I'm going to read about that in a minute. Sins will be blotted out. And the loud cry will go forth to warn the people of the planet that Jesus is coming to get ready. Let's look about it. Peter referred to it in his Pentecostal, in his sermon, not the Pentecostal sermon, but in his sermon in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. That's a mouthful in itself, isn't it? This is the preparation for the Advent. These are simple words. We've heard them a lot. Laodicea, the message of Laodicea, the last church, the message is to repent. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be what? Not just forgiven, blotted out. This is a day of atonement idea. A judgment of the living idea. When times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. This is the latter rain. Peter's preaching about it way back in the day of Pentecost. Times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall do what? Send Jesus. There is the second coming. And he will send Jesus. Which before was preached to you whom the heaven must receive until times of restitution of all things. You know we're living in the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken of by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. The whole New Testament moves toward that one point when Jesus comes as King of kings and Lord of lords to take his people home. Now let's examine Revelation 18. Revelation 18, verse 1. That's where we started. Revelation 18, verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. My margin says, illuminated with his glory. Character of God here. The character of God will be spread, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world with great power. As you know, Revelation is a book of symbols. This angel symbolizes this end time powerful message of God's last gospel work on the earth involving all the forces of heaven, the angels, God's end time people are included in this who are the heralds of the advent. And of course, the Holy Spirit who gives power to all of this. In Acts 1.8, it talks about after this you'll receive power. It isn't talking about a single angel here, but rather God's total resources will be spent in this last revival outreach powered by the latter reign of the Holy Spirit as he inspires 
and empowers men and angels to finish the work heralding the advent. I'd have liked to have heard William Miller preach, wouldn't you? He was talking about this same thing a long time ago. And we're still here. I read this little statement someplace. Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter her final conflict. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as an army with banners, she is to go forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. Power, great light, great glory, and the message. Really, <clears throat> this is a message, uh, verse 2, that is a repeat of the second angel. Verse 2 says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, has become the habitation of devils, a hole of every foul spirit, and a cage for every, every unclean and hateful bird. Obviously, the fall of Babylon and the second angel's message becomes a very serious matter when we come to the very end. Notice the condition of Babylon here. But these words describe a false revival. Devils who are bringing a false latter rain before the real true one comes. How does the devil know when to do this? You know, he knows when to do this when he sees the people of God get a hold of something good and take hold of it. And uh, we have something good to take a hold of and wrap our arms around. The angel cries mightily with a strong voice. You know, in the Sligo Church, the Sligo Adventist Church in Washington, this text was read one day. And the speaker, after reading the verse, said, And what would a strong voice look like or sound like? And an elderly man with a hearing aid in the congregation near the back of the room booms out in a strong voice. He shouted so that all can hear. <laughs> the whole earth will hear this. This will be a powerful thing. It won't be 64 AD. It'll, be, it'll, you know, it'll happen in a very short period of time. A voice that can be heard. Often in our work, I don't think we're being heard very good. <laughs> Somebody told me that they just go away. <laughs> but some are hearing, and this is going to swell into a loud cry. And the latter rain falls. Earth's billions will be privy to the, that loud voice. That last call prior to Christ's return, something is going to be heard around the world. And what is it? Right here, you can get bogged down with a discouraging message that Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen. And the habitation of devils and all these unclean things that are happening in the churches will be a revival, but it'll be a false revival. Now that's not good news, and yet it's good news in one way, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. There is in verse 2 an important idea, an encouraging idea. Let's look and see if we can find it. It says that Babylon becomes the habitation of devils. This is a false revival now. There's going to be miracles wrought. Every foul spirit, every unclean and hateful bird, this is the message of false revival. Demons will bring a, about a false revival to the inhabitants of the world. It will soon be, it will seem as the ultimate in human goodness. It might even be associated with, let's get the earth cleaned up, right? And I'll tell you what, as the, as the trumpets begin to blow, the earth's going to be a great, a great environmental mess. False revival, it spells out the condition of the religious world just before Jesus comes. The devil knows when to bring it on. The false miracles will be wrought. False fire will fall from heaven, and the world will be greatly deceived. Let's look at it. It's in Revelation chapter 13. To the left, just a few pages. Revelation chapter 13. I want to read about a false revival. Here it is. This is a beast with the lamb-like horns. I'm going to start with verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. I think all of us know what that beast is. Lamb-like horns. And he spoke with, 
and he spoke with it like spoke as a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and to and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that now here's here's the revival. He talks about it in another place here. He doeth great wonders so that he make fire come down from heaven on the earth in sight of men. And he deceives them that dwell upon the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the beast in his image should be killed. And as he causes both small and great and rich and poor and free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, so that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. False revival. Let's go back to Revelation 18 again, verse 3 this time. Revelation 18, verse 3, and let's unpack that a little bit. <clears throat> Wine in the, in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, is a symbol of something. It's a symbol of false doctrines. It comes from false prophets who will be all over the world. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 24 when he talked about what it would be like before Jesus comes. Verse 3, Revelation 18, verse 3. For all nations, how many nations? This is a worldwide revival of false revival. All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth. Everybody's involved in this revival. It even involves economics. I don't know if you're watching the news very much lately. <laughs> Things are not doing very good. There are no human solutions to any of these things. It says, And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. All nations have drunk of false doctrines by this time, false ideas about God, Pretty inclusive here. And all the world is in great wonderment at what's going on. The miracles. I believe that these miracles, one day, there will be healings. And some of these miracles may bring Seventh-day Adventists even to the test. To the law and to the testament, if they speak not according to this word, is because they're what? No light in them. And that verse... <clears throat> Isaiah 20 is preceded by a verse about demonology all kinds of miracles happening now Revelation 18 verses 4 and 5 for her sins now wait a minute and I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of her my people do you know where the greatest concentration of God's people are today they're in the religious bodies Strewn out across the world. They're not all Christian bodies even. There are others. People are going to come out of these bodies. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. God has people there. God has people. Very few of these people are in the Adventist church. When you think of earth's billions. Come out of her, my people, that ye be par not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. In order to get any sense out of this page, passage, we need to know what Babylon is and what it is all about. You've all heard of the Walden Seas, right? The Walden Seas in the days before the great Protestant Reformation. The Walden Seas. They lived in the mountains. And they lived there because they were being chased out of their places. Because they believed the Bible. The great, the days just before the Protestant reformers. They were at risk for their lives. And many of them were martyred. They were part of the, they were a part of the 50 million Christians who lost their lives during the 1260 year period, 50 million. Some estimates are as high as 100 million people who died for their faith. 
Well, these Waldenses, at great risk to their lives, took the position that Babylon had something to do with Roman Christian, Christ, Christianity. They took that position. Perhaps you are aware that this was also Martin Luther's position. And every reformer to the man had that position. I have the, I have the writings of Calvin at home, the Institutes of Calvin. Eight pages are, are, are donated to this, denoted to this, this idea about what Babylon is. They knew. They used Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and Daniel 7 to, show, to prove their point. They were living in those times during the 1260 years. They knew what it was. We've been very sheltered. In my lifetime, I have been very sheltered religiously. I can believe what I want to believe and talk to people what I, what I want to talk about, right? We're not going to talk about that today, <laughs> about the reformers. That was Middle Ages. It is important to know about. But this passage in Revelation 18 is about the end time, 2021. Some things never change for the better, but get worse and worse and more obnoxious to God. And by the time Jesus comes, her sins have reached to heaven and God is going to do something about it. In fact, in Joel 3, it says, he will roar out of Zion, roar out of Zion to, 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 to receive his prized possession because the world is about ready to, to fall completely apart. You'll find that in Joel chapter 3. Babylon got started at the Tower of Babel. That's right, isn't it? Somebody say amen to that. <laughs> That's where Babylon got started, at the Tower of Babel. Nimrod, the wicked mighty hunter, and his corrupt wife, Samarimus, were instigators of pagan sun worship and moon worship. We have Sunday and Monday, moon day, and they worship the, the planets, and and this false worship spread out across the whole Mediterranean rim in the Eastern world very rapidly. They all had sun gods. Started here at Babel. The city and the tower, what they built was they followed through on their philosophy of rebellion against God and his word who promised that there would not be another destruction of the world by a flood of water. God promised not to, not to send another flood. But in rebellion, they made bricks and mortar. They built a tower that reached to heaven. They didn't believe God's promise, God's word. Classic example here of man trying to save himself. That's what he, they were doing. The very origins of Babylon was in saving oneself by his own works in rebellion against God's word. This is an important word. I heard somebody say the other day that somebody had been attending a church and they, they didn't even have a Bible there. there. Nobody had Bibles. That's what a false reformation is going to be built on. The rejection of God's word. Centuries later, Nebuchadnezzar was caught up in the same trap. The city of Babylon became the capital of the world. It became a continuation really of Babel hundreds of years later after Babel. Nebuchadnezzar wandered around in his backyard one day and he looked out across, the, across the, the great city and he said, is not this great Babylon which I have built by, the, by my power, my power? And Nebuchadnezzar had an eye problem. That city was fortressed by walls thick enough for two chariots to pass on the top of the wall. He built the great hanging gardens of Babylon which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. for his pagan wife. The fourth angel was, you know, we might excuse Nebuchadnezzar, the fourth angel hadn't sounded yet, right? <laughs> but you know, Nebuchadnezzar had a lot of opportunities. He had a dream, Daniel 2, the Daniel, Daniel 2 dream. After Daniel explained to him about this dream, guess what happened? He said, God's, your God is a good God. And then chapter 3 talks about, about a golden image. Who Nebuchadnezzar says, that's me. 
Bow down and worship it. We know about the, about the fire and the furnace. Killed the men who threw the three worthies into the fire. And if you want to know how quickly the work can be finished, don't think that the work is going to go on for years and years and years. If you want to know how quickly the work can be finished, you know, all the sheriffs and counselors and governors of those, of those uh, various kingdoms were there that day. 120 provinces of Babylon. They were there and they watched all this and they saw it. And when they went home, Believe me, they had something to talk about. And the whole Babylonian Empire knew about this probably very, very quickly. And by the time we get to, to Daniel chapter, chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar learned that the God was really the God of heaven. That he's able to tear men down from their lofty perches so that they worship the true God. I believe Nebuchadnezzar will be in heaven. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to talk to him? He found out about God the hard way. Seven years out there in the forest. Can't you see Daniel kind of, kind of peeking through the bushes for seven years? <laughs> Daniel watched over him. And the heavenly watchers watched over him too. And one day he came to himself. <laughs> he probably saw all the extra hair on his face and the nails were as long as an eagle's claw. Daniel was happy. God was happy. Great victory was brought that day. Babylon represents a term derived from Babel. It, sig it, sig it signifies confusion about the gospel in the Christian world and in the religious world in general. Babylon falls because it ignores the everlasting gospel of the first angel's message. The message of the first angel. The message of the first angel is all about Jesus' work in the most holy place and the righteousness of Christ. That's what brings the latter rain. An understanding and a, and a humbling of self before that wonderful message that we can do nothing, but he is the one. That's why we give him glory for every ounce of inspiration that we have within us. It all derives from, Babylon all derives from a do-it-yourself religion. John 10, verse 1. Let's look at it. I'm winding down here a little bit. Hope. John 10, verse 1. <clears throat> What do you think that an Adventist pastor should be talking about in the pulpit? <laughs> this verse is an epitome of what we th I think we should be talking about. Verily, verily, I say to you, he that enters not into the door of the sheepfold but climbs up some other way is a thief and a robber. God has a way of doing things. We need to do it God's way, right? Righteousness is by faith, plus nothing. Every false religion is based upon this problem that we've just read about in verse 1. Satan is behind that principle, and its end result is the substitution of human genius over faith. We don't pray for absolute perfection. We pray for the faith of Jesus, right? The faith of Jesus, who made his every dependence upon his Father in heaven and has paved the way for us to do the same thing. And wherever that principle of human genius is taught, there is no barrier against sin. John 15, verse 5 says, Without me you can do what? Nothing. That's a righteousness by faith idea. You don't really have to be in Babylon to be a Babylonian. It may be possible to be a victim of, of a faithless religion by sitting in an Adventist church, right? Is that possible? Now, I don't want to be misunderstood here at all. I'm not saying that church is Babylon. Never, no, never. Okay. But it's possible to do that. 
I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want to go down that road. True Adventist theology is based on the righteousness that is of faith. And I'll tell you what, we have a perfect message. We're not yet a perfect people, but we have a perfect message. The righteousness of faith and trust in the doing and suffering of another person. I just want to read three passages of the everlasting gospel to you from the writings of Paul. I'd like to have you all turn to these verses. First one is Galatians 2, verse 16. I struggled with this for years, trying to understand what it all means. And finally, you realize you, you cast your helpless self at the feet of Jesus. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Galatians 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, we pray for the faith of Jesus, right? Pray for the faith of Jesus. Those last people whom are standing up on the earth and the devil is saying, where are the people who serve you? And he points to these people and he says, here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. Faith of Jesus. I'm going to start again with this verse. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. As a young Adventist, I had a hard time believing that. Let's look at another one. In the, bring two or three witnesses together to establish every point, right? Don't take an unclear text and build a doctrine on that. That happens sometimes. Some people have taken unclear passages like the rich man and Lazarus and build a doctrine on that. You can't do that in opposition to all the clear passages that, that precede it. And when you do that, well, you do violence to the Bible because you cause the Bible to argue against itself. You can't do that. The next one is Ephesians 2, 6 to 8. It says, Ephesians 2, 68. You want to start with verse 6? It says, he has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in him that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. <clears throat> in the ages to come, he wants to show. When's the ages to come? <laughs> when we're in heaven, he's going to show us the grace that, that brought us out of, this, out of this sinful world. And then verse 8, for by grace, and that word for is an important word in this, con word in this context, you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. What does it say next? Two good works. We're saved from something to something. First he says we're not saved by works, right? But by grace alone. But we're saved to what? The good works. The good works are the fruit of knowing Jesus. I'll tell you what, there will be good works in those who have a firm trust and faith in Jesus. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus two good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And another one. There's a bunch of them. We could more talk about a lot of them. Philippians, over just a few pages. Philippians 3, verse 9. This is the message that the world still, still needs to hear, the righteousness of Christ and his total efficacy for our salvation. Philippians 3, verse 9. And be found where? In him. Everyone who is found in Jesus will be successful in the judgment. 
be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, that is my law keeping, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And somebody might say, well, that destroys our message. We believe in the law, right? No, that doesn't destroy our message. There's nobody can keep the law except who have been saved by grace through faith. Nobody even wants to. And there's no power against sin in Babylon. Babylon fell a long time ago, and it gets worse and worse, but we don't want to fall with it. The call goes out, come out for my people. That's the good news about this idea that Babylon has fallen. There's no power in Babylon except by falsehood and deception and force and fear. God rules by the power of love. Love draws people to Jesus. And they see what he's done for us. I'll tell you what, people who really get a hold of that, when the devil sees, sees his people getting, getting a hold of that, he knows it's time for him to act. And when people really get a hold of that, they'll be really, really concerned about the law. Because it was that law that was broken by all of us that put Jesus on the tree. And... Uh, when this message becomes a part of the proclamation of the gospel and the fourth angel, there will be a revival that the world has not seen before, a call to the righteousness of faith in Christ alone. This is the antithesis of Babylon. It's the opposite of Babylon's message about a false revival. It's the antithesis of Babylon's message about I can do it my own way. The power behind gospel proclamation, of course, is the Holy Spirit. That's the basis of the final revival. It'll be the Holy Spirit, revelation to us that Jesus is my all in all. And the Holy Spirit points me to Jesus. If you want to read about that, it's, it's uh, John 16, 13 to 15. He's the great shower of Jesus. We should pray for the Holy Spirit, mainly for the purpose of knowing Jesus and knowing more about him. In Abraham's day, it was true. In David's day, it was true. I want to read one more text. Ah, time's so gone. So gone. Um, Romans chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Romans chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. Somebody told me one time, if the preacher can't say it in 25 minutes, he's not going to say it. That's probably good, good advice. Romans 4, verses 2 to 6. Here's what it says. For if Abraham were justified by works, he was, has also swear of the glory, but not before God. For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for, righteous, to righteousness, for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Not only counted for righteousness, but he have a deep desire to keep God's law. He'll want to be like David. He'll want to follow after God's commandments. It will be his meditation all the day. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness without works. So uh, it was true in Abraham's day the gospel. It was true in David's day. It was true in Paul's day. He's the one who wrote about all of these things. It was true in Luther's day, and he got it from Paul. It's true now, and it's called the everlasting gospel. That's what the first angel is all about. The final revival will be a proclamation of the everlasting gospel, which is by faith alone. Let's sing about that. It's hymn number 608. Faith is the victory. If you want a victory over sin and habits in your life and other problems, it's by faith. Faith is the victory. 